Chapter 16 A Night with Mags All right, said Mags. Now I'll show you where I got that book. She had dropped Lena's picture message from the cliff and come back. The sky was growing rapidly darker as the sun was setting and the rain clouds rising, so Mags unhooked a lantern from the side of her wagon. It was a tin can lantern with a candle burning inside, much like the lanterns used in Sparks. Follow me, she said. She headed for the grove of trees to the left of the cave entrance, the place where Lena had gathered kindling the night before. They went in among the thickets of brush and stickery branches. It was in here somewhere, Mag said, stomping through the undergrowth. I wasn't the first one who found it. That was Wash. But he showed it to the rest of us afterward. It was dark among the trees. Not much light from the sky filtered through. Mag's lantern made a spot of gold ahead of Lena, and she went fast to keep up with it. After a few minutes, the ground rose slightly uphill. Mags edged between the thickly growing tree trunks, and Lena followed, her feet swishing through the deep layers of leaves. Here we go, said Mags. Lena came up behind her and saw what she'd glimpsed before, a faint reflection glinting through the woods ahead. Now watch your step, said Mags. We're close. A moment later, Mags cried, Ouch! and stopped so abruptly that Lena almost bumped into her. Stub my toe, Mags grumped. She kicked away some leaves, and beneath them Lena saw a step, square-cornered, smooth, clearly man-made. And beyond the step, the light glinted on metal. She stared in amazement. There was a door in the mountainside. It had a metal handle, and a metal border ran along its edges. The door swung open with a creak when Mags pulled on its handle. There might be bats or animals in here, Mags said. You better let me go in first. She stepped inside. No bats, no animals, she announced. So Lena followed her in. The lantern showed them a plain, windowless room, completely empty, except for a small metal table that lay on its side on the floor. A few leaves, no doubt blown in by the wind, were scattered near the threshold. That was all. The book was in here, said Lena. There wasn't anything else in the room. Oh, yes, said Mags. There was the jewel. Wash took that, of course. He gave me the book for starting fires. The jewel? Lena asked. What was the jewel? A diamond, Mag said. That's what Wash said it was. Just like in that song I sang you. Beautiful thing. He'll be able to get a good price for it someday. Lena was mystified and disappointed. The book must be about the jewel. But why would you need a book about a jewel? Jewels were just for decoration. Anyhow, the jewel was gone. There wouldn't be much to tell, Dune, after all. Well... Thanks for showing me, Lena said. You're welcome, said Mags. Now we need to get back to my wagon and get going if we're going to make any progress at all before dark. They didn't make much progress. They walked for half an hour or so, and then the light was entirely gone from the sky. Time to set up camp, Mags said. Over there looks like a good place. Herding the sheep with shouts and pokes, she headed for a clump of low-spreading oak trees, and when the wagon was under their branches, she halted the horse that was towing it and unhooked his harness. "'What's that horse's name?' Lena asked. "'Happy,' said Mags. "'He doesn't look happy,' Lena said. "'Well, he used to be. He's old, and it's hard to be happy when you're old.' Lena wondered if this was true. She thought not. Her granny had been old, and she was usually happy. If this horse had enough to eat and didn't have to work so hard, she bet he'd be happy too. She gave his bony flank a pat. "'We'll make our fire right here,' Mag said, hacking at the ground with the heel of one boot. "'Better do it quick, before the rain comes. Get some kindling.' 
Lena scurried around, gathering up grass and twigs and branches and carrying it all to Mags. Soon Mags had built a sturdy stack, with the kindling on the bottom and bigger sticks on top. Now to get a flame, she said. She took a couple of stones out of a little pouch attached to her belt. Wait, said Lena. I have a match. She took off her pack, reached inside, and pulled out a match. Mags looked at it greedily. How many have you got? she asked. I used up the one I got from you. I only have a few left, Lena answered. She was determined to guard them carefully. She'd practiced using flint stones to make a spark, but she wasn't very good at it. She didn't want to be left without matches. Even with a match, it was hard to get the fire going. The grass was damp from the rains of winter, and even when the flame caught, the wind kept blowing it out. Lena used up two more matches, relighting it. I should never have sold that book, Mag said. We could use it right now. It's terrible to burn a book, said Lena. You never know what might be in it. Mags just said, pfft, and shook her head. Finally, the fire burned more strongly. Now, said Mags, you watch it. I'll get the wagon ready. We're both going to have to cram inside tonight. She disappeared into the wagon again. It shook and rattled, and a pot, a skillet, a couple of tin boxes, and a big bucket all came flying from its rear end. I'll have to take more out later, Mags said when she emerged. It's pretty crowded in there. It's very... unusual, Lena said. The wagon cover, I mean. So many colors. Like it, the roamer said. I made it myself. It's all pieces of old plastic and tin. Bags, raincoats, umbrellas, flat cans, stuff like that. Been collecting it for years. They had some sort of gluey soup for dinner, slightly warmed up over the fire and drunk out of cracked cups. Mag slurped hers noisily, and she talked as she slurped. For the next half hour or so, as they sat there by their small, sputtering fire, she hardly stopped talking at all. Mostly, she talked about her hardships. It was hard to find people who'd give you more than five sacks of corn for a sheep. It was hard to keep slogging back and forth between this mountain and the various miserable settlements around here. It was hard to control the sheep. If they wandered off, wolves could get them. It was hard to be out here in the winter weather, trying to find some old barn or abandoned house to take shelter in. That last big thunderstorm that came through nearly killed me, she said. I found an old stable to stay in, but water came in through the roof and put my fire out and lightning hit a tree right next to the stable and burned it to the ground. She shook her head at the sky, as if threatening whoever was up there making the weather. I am a kind and generous person, and a devoted sister, she said. But enough is enough. At that moment, something called through the darkness, a long note that soared upward, fell and faded, and soared up again. Lena turned her head quickly. What's that? Wolves, said Mags. Getting ready to hunt. I've never seen a wolf, said Lena. Well, lucky you, Mags said. It's a good idea to stay away from them. Have you seen that green star? The one that moves? Yes, Lena said. That's a weird one said Mags. Never stays in the same place like a normal star. Disappears for days on end, then comes back, moves around, acts all wrong. But it isn't dangerous, is it? asked Lena. Maybe she should add it to her list of terrible things. Who knows? Mags drained her cup and wiped it out with the tail of her shirt. Might be, might not be. Clouds had blotted out the stars by now, and the wind was flinging down the first drops of rain. The sheep, which had been wandering and munching in a loose group, began huddling together, and soon they stood right up against each other, forming a big woolly mass. "'Gotta get a new dog,' said Mags, frowning at them. 
A dog? Lena said. Why? A dog would warn me if wolves were around. It would scare them off and protect the sheep. My old dog got bitten by a rattlesnake a couple of months ago, and I haven't found a good replacement yet. Lena added rattlesnakes to her list of dangers. Do you know how to make a wolf's carrying whistle? She asked. With a grass blade? Oh, yes, Mag said. That helps sometimes. She pulled a stubby candle from one of the many bags tied onto her belt and lit it from the fire. Take this and climb in there, she said, pointing to the wagon. Quick, before you get wet. Lena took the candle in one hand and her pack in the other. She went over to the wagon's rear opening. She pushed aside a flap of the patchy cover and put one knee on the wagon and hoisted herself up. It was hard to do, holding the candle, but she managed it. She pushed her pack in and crept inside. Ick! What a place! It was low and small and crowded and smelled like sheep sweat or sheep breath or something to do with sheep, and there didn't seem room in it for even one person, much less two. Stuff hung from hooks overhead and was packed in wads on the floor and against the sides, and her candle made shadows behind every lump, in every cranny, next to every shelf and sack and bunched-up rag of clothing. Lena's heart sank, but she heard the pattering of rain on the wagon's tent, and she thought about how it would be to walk across the hills in the dark, with the rain pounding down on her face and soaking her clothes. This is better, she thought. It's awful, but it's better. There were two more or less flat surfaces, which she guessed were where they would sleep. Basically, they were benches with blankets and other stuff piled on them. They were right next to each other along the length of the wagon, with only a few inches between. She'd be sleeping very close to Mags, who had a powerful smell and might have bugs crawling on her, but there was no way around it. Lena spotted a small can with wax drippings on its sides. She stuck the candle in it to free up her hands. The wagon gave a lurch, and she staggered sideways and fell onto one of the benches. Mags's shaggy head appeared at the rear. "'That's right!' she shouted. "'That one's yours! Rain is here! I'm coming in!' At first, there really wasn't room for both of them at all. Lena scrunched up her knees, and Mags banged around, shifting and shoving things, and stuff clattered down from hooks and shelves and bumped into Lena's head, and Mags grumbled and muttered, and the rain spattered even harder on the canvas roof. Some of this stuff, Mags said, I can just pitch out. She tossed a soup pot and a water bottle out into the night, and then a dishpan and some rubber boots and a broken three-legged stool. Might need these tonight, though. I'll keep them close. She reached up and tugged on something, and suddenly a flock of tin cans cascaded onto her head with a terrific clatter. Mags didn't seem bothered. She lifted an arm, and Lena saw that the cans were all strung together in a bunch. What's that? she asked. It's to scare off wolves, Mag said. She shook the bunch, and the violent clatter sounded again. I made it myself. If we hear any wolf noises in the night, we just go out and shake these around. Usually works. It was a long and very uncomfortable night. The wind rocked the wagon, and drips of rain crept in through the seams of the canvas tent. Mag snored and groaned and thrashed around, jabbing Lena with an elbow now and then, and breathing rotten onion breath. Lena pressed as far from her as she could, up against the side of the wagon, and closed her eyes. But there was no peaceful darkness inside her mind. She was haunted by visions. Dune hauled away by kidnappers. Ember smoke-filled and fire-lit. Dreadful strangers with flames on their heads. And the angry faces she expected to see when she got back to Sparks, having caused more trouble than the town already had. That same night, Kenny and Lizzie and Torrin were also having trouble sleeping. They were listening unhappily to the rain. What if it didn't stop by morning? What if they couldn't go on their rescue adventure? All three of them really, really wanted to. 
and down in ember, in the lair of the trogs, Dune wasn't even trying to sleep. He was thinking as hard as he could, putting together in his mind everything he'd seen and heard during the day, everything that might give him a clue about how to free himself. Finally, a possibility came to him. If he was wrong, he'd be in even worse trouble than now. But he thought he might be right. His heart started up a fast and steady thudding. <laughs>